something very quick that I want to mention is that um, if there is interest, we are thinking to have a baptism service on Easter Sunday within our morning worship service. So I would like to encourage you, if you have trusted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you believe in your heart that he died for your sins and you have made peace with him, but have not yet been baptized by immersion, I would like to encourage you to follow God's command and take this important step in our Christian walk. <laughs> Baptism is an outward expression of an inward work of God that he has produced in, into our hearts. So if Christ is your savior, we would like to encourage you to take that step. Please see me or one of the deacons or even let our secretary know and they will let me know. I would like to meet with you and I would like to get you ready for this important step in your life. Even if you have questions about salvation or you are not sure that you would like to be baptized yet, but still uh, you've been thinking about it lately and you would like to talk about this topic, I welcome that opportunity. Please think about it and pray about it. And between now and Easter Sunday, we will get you ready for that. Okay? By the way, it's very hot in here. I don't know if you guys did this on purpose or not. You want me to keep it short or what? But in any case, it is very hot in here. Okay, one more thing. I have a riddle for you. Those of you who are friends with me on Facebook, you cannot answer this. Because I posted this on Facebook, on my Facebook page yesterday, and you know the answer to this. So if you are friends with me on Facebook and you've seen this, please don't say anything. Okay, so the riddle is this. The Sunday, what comes after the recessional hymn? Not the benediction. The folks who forgot to change their clocks ahead. <laughs> All right. Open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll be reading with verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquired, that, inquired what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven Things into which angels long to look. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise you. It is great to be in this place here today. We thank you, Father, for this gathering that we can have in your name. We thank you for this local congregation, the First Baptist Church of Casson. We thank you for what it stands for. We thank you that Sunday after Sunday, through the Sunday school classes, and through our worship services, through the faithful teaching of our uh, um, Sunday school teachers and through the faithful preaching of your word, Father, we get to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Father, we praise you for that. We know that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And we are honored and blessed to be uh, here today, Father, to encourage each other uh, to pray with each other, to sing together praises and glories to your name, and also to be able to open your word 
and hear your word. Father, we pray that in the following minutes, through the power of your Holy Spirit, Spirit, you would speak truth to us. Father, you know what we need to hear. We pray that your word will be beneficial to our hearts and minds once again today, that it will produce the necessary change and transformation that as a result of us being here today, we would be more like Jesus and we would want to make Jesus known in this week that is ahead of us. We pray in the name of Jesus, Father, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I could have entitled my sermon for today in so many different ways. I chose, for the sake of putting something in the bulletin, I chose the title, More Precious Than Gold. But I want you to know that today's message could have easily been entitled, Joy in Suffering. Today's message could also have easily been entitled, Joy in the Midst of Trials. And for the next few minutes, the question that I would like us to answer is this. How is it possible and right for Christians to rejoice in their trials? I mean, you tell an unbeliever, someone, an unbeliever, someone who doesn't believe in the uh, God of the Bible and in Jesus Christ, that you are rejoicing in the midst of your suffering, and excuse me, but they will think that you are nuts. Seriously now. They will think that we have lost our marbles. They will think that something is not right with you. And the question that I get to hear over and over again, how could you guys, how could you people of God have joy? How is it possible for those who profess to walk with Christ to have joy? in the midst of their trials. Before we answer this question, I would like to spend a few minutes and share with you what the world thinks, the outside world thinks about trials and joy. The world says trials and suffering will diminish or destroy your joy. The world says when you are facing a trial, you need to do your best to avoid it if you see it coming or find ways to remove whatever elements are there that have caused that suffering and that pain. If you want to be fulfilled, if you want to be satisfied, remove whatever hinders you from being satisfied and fulfilled in this world because boy, you only live once and you better make the most out of it. My brother and sister in Christ, I want you to know that for the most part, what the world says, it is in complete contradiction with what the word of God says. How is it possible and right for Christians to have joy in the midst of our trials? I think that the answer to this question is found in the first part of verse 6, our passage for today. I want us to say all, to, us to say all together those one, two, three, four words. Let's say it. In this you rejoice. Wow. All of a sudden, wait a minute. It, it is possible. It is possible for the children of God to have joy in the midst of this trial. And God through Peter is saying this. In this people of God, you can rejoice. By the way, if you translate uh, uh, the, from the Greek word, the English word that we have, rejoice. If you translate from Greek into English, and you give it the exact literal meaning of the Greek word, the word rejoice in Greek actually means exceedingly joy, abundant rejoicing and joy. And Peter says in this, 
you rejoice. So when I'm in a, if, 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 if in this I rejoice, then I better know, Peter, what you are referring to. What does this word, this, go back to? I better know what this word, this, refers back to. And I think, church, that it is very clear the word this <laughs> refers, back to, to the, refers back to the things that we have talked about for the last three Sundays. We spent three sermons, three sermons on the first five verses of 1 Peter chapter 1. The word this, it is the answer. It refers back to the divine work of God, who in his grace, number one, has chosen us to be his, verse one. Number two, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That verse three. Number three, has granted us an inheritance that is, Peter says, imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. That's verse four. And then number four, who in his grace also has granted us, Peter says, a privilege to be kept by him, by his power. It is what verse five says, and who by his power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Notice, please, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, how Peter is reminding us here that no matter how, how hard life may become, God sustained, uh, sustains us. And not only does God sustain us, but God is sustaining our faith. And now listen to the detail here. By his power. So when trials come and doubts arise and sleepless nights may take place at times, we are not left alone to sustain our own faith in our own power. Church, it is by his power that he guards our, that he guards our faith so that no trial and no suffering and no obstacle and no pain that we will ever face will cause us to lose our faith in him. And I don't know about you, but to me, that's a glorious promise that I cling unto every single day. That the God who gave me his saving faith so that I can be saved once and for all, the God who gave me his saving faith as a gift, it's a gift, even your faith and my faith. The God who gave us his saving faith will also sustain and strengthen our faith through suffering. Until that day when we receive, Peter says, our imperishable, our undefiled, our unfading inheritance that's preserved in heaven for us. Glory be to God. Wow. I want you to know also here that Peter doesn't encourage us to rejoice in the suffering itself. So again, let me go back to this. So it is in this that you rejoice. <laughs> it is in this that you rejoice. People are wondering, how can you people have joy in the midst of trials? What do you do? What formulas do you have what things do you have up your sleeves you know you know that expression what do you do well nothing magical gospel-centered faith 
In this I rejoice. I rejoice that he has been chosen me before the foundation of the world. I am God's elect. I rejoice in the fact that he has caused me to be born again to a living hope. Man, living is the opposite of death. Dead. Dead hope ends at the grave. Living hope never ends. I rejoice in the fact that he has granted me an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, unfading. And then I rejoice in the fact that I am kept by his power. And Jesus says, I give them life. That's eternal life. And no one can snatch them out of my hand. Glory be to God. I want you to know, church, that Peter here doesn't encourage us to rejoice in the suffering itself. No, it will be ridiculous. You know, you go to the doctor, they do some tests, you're not feeling well, you get cancer. Well, I'll tell you this right now. Pastor John, if, if he gets cancer or anything, anything, I, I ain't going to rejoice in that cancer. Oh, God, I've been waiting for this cancer for so long. No. You can't. Let's be honest now. You can't rejoice in the suffering itself. It will be ridiculous. That's not what Peter is saying here. Suffering reminds us of the evil in this world. Suffering by itself accomplishes nothing. By itself. Nothing. Just discouragement and pain and despair. Peter says, people of God, this, right here, this, should provoke within you. Not when you die. Right now. It should provoke within you a joy, an exceeding joy. Whenever you may suffer, you are to remember that you are safe in God's grace. And in this grace, we have the ability to rejoice no matter what our present circumstances may be. Glory be to God. Sadly, sadly to say this, and I'm including myself obviously in, in this, sadly to say this, we are all tempted to find many times, to try to find our joy in many of the things that this world has to offer. And that may explain why we at times feel as if our lives are lived in a continuous emotional roller coaster. I'll give you some examples. When our joy is rooted in our financial security, our joy will rise and fall based on the amount of money we have in the bank. When our joy is rooted in a particular relationship, our joy will rise and fall based on, the, based on how that person is going to respond to me. When our joy is rooted in our social standing, our joy will rise and fall on the basis of whether we are accepted by others or we are rejected by others. When our joy is rooted in our present, present circumstances, our joy will rise and then fall on the basis of whether or not we are having a good day or a bad day. But God, church, is teaching us through Peter today that because our joy is Rooted in God and in the salvation that he has granted us in Christ and applied to us by the power of his spirit, and that is the Holy Spirit, then and only then we would be able to have joy in all circumstances. In thus you rejoice. And I was thinking this week as I was studying and meditating upon the Lord, word of God, I said, I burst into, I, I talk to myself. That's what I do. If you walk on me in, in my office, and, and Brother David, who's worked a lot on the elevator for the last, you know, few weeks, 
uh, he walked on me many times in my office, and he found me talking to myself. And I warned him ahead of time, I'm talking to myself. Uh, anyway, that's one of the things that preachers do when they are by themselves. And at times I drive the car and my kids say, Dad, are you, are you again thinking of something? Are you talking to yourself? Like, yes, I am. But anyway, I'm thinking, I was thinking this week, Lord, what a paradox. What a paradox our Christian life is that we can rejoice in the midst of great distress. James says in chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Count it all joy when you face various trials. And Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5, he says, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Hallelujah. Love that. Next, I want you to see now that Peter, speaking of trials, in those who rejoice, not in the trials itself, itself, but in who God is and who you are and where you are going. And now, Peter, I want to point out to you from this passage, points us to us or describes our trials in four ways. Speaking of trials that we need to rejoice in the midst of. It is how Peter describes our trials. First of all, Peter says that our trials are temporary. He says in verse 6, In this you rejoice, though now, what comes next? For a little while. I like that. Trials are temporary. You know, at times we fret about things and we get sad about things. And a year passes by or two years and you look back. I don't know if you ever happened, it ever happened to you. And I say, God, why did I even fret about that thing? <laughs> now that I look back, <laughs> that, that was a piece of cake. I shouldn't even dwell upon it. So as we go to trials, Peter says, realize this. They are temporary, though now for a little while. Someone said that when God permits his children to, to go through the furnace, he keeps his eyes on the clock and his hands on the thermostat. Like that. Trials are temporary. Compared to eternity, this is how we need to look at trials. Compared to eternity, compared to glory, Trials have a brief duration. Peter says they last just a little while. Paul says in Romans 8, 18, that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. Praise God for that. Temporary. Don't let them get to you. They are, past, you. they are passing by. Notice also, please, second of all, when he describes our trials, that Peter says that our trials meet needs. He says, if necessary, look again at verse 6. He says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while. He says, if necessary. It's another version of the Bible that I looked at. It says, if needed be. And that indicates that there are special times when God knows that we need to go to trials. Trials meet needs. Sometimes, for example, trials are meant to discipline us when we intentionally choose to disobey God. Because we are his children, the Bible says he's going to chastise his children. Other times, God allows trials in our lives to prepare us for spiritual growth. The, the idea here is that we do not always know the need, the exact need that is being met. But we can trust God to know and that he will do 
what is best for us. Peter tells us that our suffering, in other words, is not random, it's not accidental. It is designed by God to accomplish his purposes in us. They are necessary. They humble us. They help us focus on Christ and to turn our attention from self to the Savior. Number three. Trials are not just temporary, Peter says. They, they don't just meet needs. But Peter says, trials are varied and diverse. He says, let's look at, again at verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Oh. And what that means is that they come at different times. And they come for different durations. And they also come, listen to this, in different forms. There will be a season in your life when you will maybe lack provision. There will be a season in your life when you may be lacking power. There might come a season in your life when you would be lacking position. I know during the communist regime that I led under, by the way, you know what March 8 is for me, and this is March 8, and I praise God for that. And I'm reminded of the communist regime. No matter how smart you were, I mean, we had smart Christians in Romania, smart believers who could have been leading institutions in departments and hospitals and companies, but because they chose not to deny Christ, But to be, to openly profess that they are followers of Christ, they were taking their positions away from them. They could not lead companies. They could not get great jobs. And there might be a time when your position will be taken away from you. Various trials. Diverse. Seasons when your protection may be taken away from you. At times you may become the trial could be so diverse that at times you may become the recipient of verbal or physical persecution for wanting to remain faithful to God and his word. So keep that in mind, church of God. Trials are varied and diverse. And God in his sovereignty matches all of our trials according somehow to our strength and to our needs. Therefore, don't look at so-and-so and say, oh, I wish I had. The problems that he's been going through are nothing compared to the problems I've been going through. I wish I had his lot or her portion. No, believe me. I wouldn't want to have your lot, and you wouldn't want to have my lot. God is designing our trials according to our Needs and they are custom made. Notice, please, I love what Peter mentions here in verse 6. We are digging here. He says, You have been grieved. Not only are, are these trials temporary, they meet the needs, they, they are varied, but, but, but you've been grieved by them. You've been grieved by them. Uh, and you know what that means? Well, I see here that Peter doesn't want us to minimize our trials. Doesn't want us to pretend that trials are something that in reality they are not. <laughs> Instead, he speaks of our trials as being grievous. They are hard, aren't they? Yes, they are. And we've been trained as, as counselors and when people are are grieving and, and, and hurting. Boy, not to preach at them, not to uh, uh, minimize that grief. No, to weep with those who weep. I heard mentalities that say that Christians shouldn't be grieving. That should, oh, if you have the joy of the Lord, shouldn't even be saved. No, you shouldn't even be sad. No, you be, Peter knows that. You, you've been grieved by them. Church, it is okay to grieve. It is okay to acknowledge that that's, that trials has caused a lot of grief in your heart. But guess what? 
Our grieving, even though it's there and it should be there, it's okay to grieve. Our grieving is not like the grieving of those who do not know the Lord. Amen? Amen. Our grieving is different. We grieve with hope. A living hope, that is. In other words, it is how I look at it. We can smile even as we cry. Yeah. Last but not least, notice please that Peter says that our trials are revealing. He says here, uh, verse... Five, let's look at verse uh, six. He says, In this you rejoice, do not for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. And now listen to verse seven. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, that's more precious than gold that perishes through it, though it, it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice, please, the trials are revealing. Our trials and afflictions are, have, have, a, have a scope, have a purpose. They reveal something. Peter declares here that our trials demonstrate, as God purifies us, just like a you know, a goldsmith, you know, uh, uh, one of those people who do, who do jewelries, they, they take the, the, the gold and purifies it through fire, and then you get a beautiful ring on your finger. Boy, if you would know, if I and you would know the process that this ring had to go through before it is what it is right now shining in on my finger, that's exactly what trials do. Trials... And us being purified through fire, fires and trials demonstrate the genuineness of our faith. There is a purpose, purpose here. There is a test that God is putting us through. And I have a question for you here. Who is this test for? This testing of our faith. Who is this testing of our faith for? I would argue here and I would say that the testing of our faith that's revealing the genuineness of our the genuineness of our faith, our authenticity before God, the testing of our faith is not for God. And I'll tell you why. Um, last year, if you remember, we did the attributes of God. Sermon series on the attributes of God. And if I remember correctly, Brother Larry a few times in his Sunday school even brought a few attributes of God. And we know that one of the attributes of God is that our God is omniscient. Isn't he? And we know that Jesus is the perfecter and finisher of our faith. Therefore, I would argue and say that this test is not for him. Why? Because God already knows whether or not my faith and your faith is genuine. So then the question is, who is this test for? And I would argue here and say that this test is for you and for me and for the outside world to see. It is to show us, it is how it is for us. It is to show us that while we may still feel weak, and boy, I believe we all agree with that, because I don't feel like a giant, a strong giant man of faith when I go to trials. I'm not afraid to admit it. So this testing, it is for us, so that even though while we may feel weak and feeble and anemic in our faith, when we are in that fiery furnace of trials, God knows and thinks differently of us. And he wants us to know that it is not the size of our faith that matters. It is the object of our faith that makes all the difference. My friends, our faith also has the purifying of our faith has an external purpose. 
You know what that purpose is? To bring glory and honor to God, just like everything else should do in a Christian's walk here on earth. Because when the world is watching us and see us how differently we handle our trials than they do, there is no better advertisement for God than this. In the end, they themselves would be able to glorify God and boast in our God. Our faith, here is how I look at this, our faith is this beautiful treasure that resides or dwells in jars of clay. You want to know who Pastor John is? You want to know what this is? This is a jar of clay. And my faith and your faith, that genuine faith, is a treasure that re re resides in jars of clay to highlight not a jar, not a vessel, but the gift that has been given to me. And the giver, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, glory be to his name. Amen. Notice, please, and I'm going to close with this. The description of our faith is found in verse 8. I love this. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you, do not, though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. I hear people ask at times, Sir, why should I love and serve and trust and obey someone that I've never met and I cannot connect with? in any tangible way. My answer is this. It takes faith. That's the essence of faith. In verse 8, Hebrews eleven six 6 also. And it's a faith that is focused and based on the unbreakable promises of God. And it is also a faith, church, that is guaranteed that our inheritance will be preserved for us and we will be preserved also for that inheritance. What's the result? Peter says, indescribable and inexpressible joy. We can even rejoice in our sorrows and in our losses. Why? Because our joy is not anchored in our experiences. Our joy is anchored in Jesus Christ, in the steadfast, in the sure, in the loving, in the grace-soaked, in the mercy-driven promises of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is why we have that song that says, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, I am standing on the promises of God. I love it how John Piper puts it. John Piper says, Christian joy, one of my favorite servants of God. I love Pastor John. He says, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul. And it's like I'm seeing Piper saying this. <laughs> Produce, produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world. Amen? Couple of challenges. First challenge is for those of, all, those of you who may not have responded in faith yet to God's offer of salvation. And second challenge is for those of us who are saved already. So for those of you who do not know Christ yet, who have not called upon him to be your personal Lord and Savior, I would challenge you as a servant of God today to visualize Christ right now, not as your Savior, 
but as your judge. I'm praying that you would be able to see that God will open your blind eyes right now and you would be able to see the penetrating eyes of his holiness into your sinful heart as you are openly rebelling against him. And may you today, that's been my prayer the entire week, as you have heard his voice, not harden your heart. Because my friend, unless you repent, someday you would hear the words, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. So I encourage you today, if you have not given your heart to the Lord yet, if he's not your Lord and Savior right now, think of him right now as your judge. And before you go home, make peace with him. Then second of all, the second challenge is for those of us who are believers. For those of you who do, not know, who do know Christ, I hope that if you have placed already your faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross, but somehow you have allowed the perils of this life and the cares of this world to drag you down, to distract you from the joy of your salvation, I hope and pray, and I've been praying for this the whole week, I hope and pray that through this passage, through this text, through this word of God, that God will grab a hold of your heart, a hold of your soul, and I hope and pray that God will ignite once again the flames of joy that are your rightful possession as you think on the fact that Jesus shed his blood for you and you are being kept by his power for that salvation ready to be revealed. When I fear my faith will fail, I love that song, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter will prevail, he can hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that when the trials come, we don't have to fight them in the flesh and blood. We thank you that we have you. You are our strong tower. You are our savior. We know that we do not have a high priest that is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tried in all aspects, just like we are. We thank you that when those trials come, we can come to the throne of grace so that we can receive mercy and find help in our time of need. Father, help us to stand firm on the truth that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And as your people, Father, help us to be joyful in the midst of our present sorrows and sufferings as we long for that day when we shall see you face to face and dwell with you forever. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.